Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I should have thought about this earlier. Oh, okay, good. It just lifts. I was like, if this is going to be one of those unscrew the sides and then figure out how to, no, this is going to be awkward for just a couple of minutes because I needed it raised. Uh, so my name is Matt Griswold. Like you said, you might know me uh, through as the leader of the small group ministry throughout the, the church. If you're interested in getting connected, I would love to share more information with you about that and what that looks like. Um, we, I think my wife and I successfully bamboozled three different couples into joining our small group last semester. There's one of them over there. Yeah, uh, there's another one over there. Thank you. I'm glad you own that. Yeah, just a miscommunication, but I'm sure they're glad they did it. So if you'd like to join a small group, then, then we would love to have you uh, be a part of that as well. You might know me because my wife, Rianne, uh, here, she's all over the place. I don't know. Okay. Maybe you don't know me because of that. Uh, you might know me because we just bring a whole bunch of kids and we sit right here in the front and we dance during worship time. You might know me because of that too. So I don't know. Any, any one of those, those times. Today is my son's birthday. He's 15 today. Yeah. We're not going to sing to him. That'd be weird. But what we are going to do is create like a tunnel as we exit and everybody can just <laughs> give him one of those, you know what I mean? And just make, I don't know. Uh, so let me talk to you about what I do uh, normally. My normal job is I, I get to be in front of people and, I, and uh, I'm a business and leadership consultant and I get to travel all over the country and help organizations and people, culture, process, stuff like that. I love it. I think God's gifted me the, the ability to be able to use my voice to be able to um, empower people. Uh, but there's one thing that I really like to do more than my job, even uh, you know, as much as I love it. I love to get the opportunity to preach because I don't think there's any better way to be able to use my voice to be able to uh, than to you know proclaim God and just uh, talk about the Bible and read the Bible and let's talk about that. So today, um, as we go forward, we're going to talk about okay. So how do we make the most use of our time and what does the Bible teach us about that? But let me start with a story because I like to teach through stories. So a few years ago, my wife and I took a weekend trip to Branson. Many of you have done this uh, before. And we took a weekend trip to Branson. It was lovely. We were on our way back home. Everything was great. It started to rain. So I turned the wipers on. I don't know if this is a guy thing, a mat thing, a husband thing. I don't know. But I turned them on just enough to where the water would get, you know, cover the windshield. And I could barely see the yellow line and the white line. As long as I could see those two lines, then I was okay. And then the wipers would come on and wipe it all away. And I didn't even notice that. But we're doing that for a few miles until my wife says, Matt, Turn on the wipers. We can't even, how do you even know where you're going? You can't even see where you're going. Now, uh, I don't know, husbands, if you're like me, but I was going to take this opportunity to teach my wife a lesson. I was going to, this was a, this is a teachable moment. How can I translate this into some sort of a spiritual moment that we can have together? So I said, um, well, honey, I, I actually view this as a picture of Jesus in my life. You know, <laughs> sin creeps in, clouds my judgment. I can barely see. I can barely see where I'm going, Right? And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and is like, whoosh, gone, right? Wipes away the sin. And I thought I had won. I thought I had said, yep, I, w- I just won a teachable moment right there for my wife. To which my wife, who everybody knows, if, if you know her, she's the smarter of the two of us. And she says, oh, that's how you view Jesus, just when it's convenient to wipe away your sin. Because what I want is Jesus all the time in my life like this, just constantly <laughs> batting, away the, batting away the sin. Yeah. I had no comeback for that except for touche, wife. That is a teachable moment. She just taught me something. Or this, uh, a few years ago, several years ago, uh, actually, I, I was the worship leader at our previous church as well. And, and, and man, we would practice. And um, some of these songs that were great, like I was read, I was so excited to be able to bring some of these songs to you all. And I was excited and we would practice and I would get, get going. And, and, and if you know me there, like I'm just the same up here all over the place, right? Because it's just, we're just praising and worship. And I would get so frustrated. And one Sunday morning, I got so frustrated because there was a great song. Like we worked really hard on it. Super, super uh, holy song, right? Super uh, praising song. And then looking out there sometimes, by the way, looking out there at you people sometimes during those impactful songs and you guys are going like this. Or you're yawning visibly, like you're bored. Or you're checking your phone. I know it's nobody in here, probably just the person to the left or right of you. (laughs) But when you're doing that, it frustrated me. So I went and I got in the car to my wife. And I said, how can they be like that? Like that was, we nailed it. That song was awesome. Are they just not feeling it or what? Like, am I doing something wrong? And my wife looked at me and she said, who are you singing for? Right in the face just punched me verbally right in the face. And I thought, teachable moment. So whenever you are standing next to somebody, and I want to say this too, by the way, that Great Great Are You Lord song 
It's an awesome song with an awesome chorus. Like we, we you know, they, they did a great job on that. And I would encourage you, like if you were that person standing there and you just wanted to raise your hand or you just wanted to like sing, I don't know, some of us kind of, I can see your lips moving, but nothing comes out. But if you just wanted to sing or if you wanted to raise your hand, you're like, no, that's weird. Person next to me is going to judge me. Don't care, right? Don't care. Not singing for any one of you. No offense. But these songs are not for us. These songs are, are for Christ. This message is not, for, not necessarily meant to speak to any one of you. I'm speaking to myself at the same time as, as we're about to talk about this. So this is my point in telling those stories. The Bible is full of teachable moments. And this will be your first fill in the blank. No offense, by the way, if your eyes aren't here, I get it. If your eyes need to be on the sidewalls, sidewalls for the scripture. But the Bible is full of teachable moments. Those teachable moments, sometimes we're able to give the best teachable moments to our spouses and what that looks like. Sometimes we think we're giving the one, then we're actually the one receiving that teachable moment. But really, the Bible is full of these teachable moments. And there's just a few. Let me give you a few examples, okay? John chapter 8. Jesus is there. These teachers and these Pharisees bring this woman caught in the middle of adultery to Jesus. Now, there's a bigger story in, in, into this, but I'm going to go straight to the teachable moment. Because they bring, the teachers and the Pharisees, right, bring this woman caught in the middle of adultery to Jesus. And they said, hey, Jesus, she was caught right in the middle of adultery. What are you going to do with her? It's basically what they're saying. Because the old law of Moses says you're supposed to stone her to death. We're supposed to kill her. And Jesus then turns around to them. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And you can imagine, I talk about this, just, you know, uh, our, our spiritual, um, you know, if we could put our spiritual hats on for, for, for just a minute, our sanctified imagination is what I refer to that. And you can imagine the scene as everybody's holding a rock, getting ready to do this. And really they're waiting for Jesus' response, but you can imagine what that looks like, this mob of people ready to kill this woman because of adultery. And she should have been killed according to the law of Moses, but Jesus said, okay, let's do it. But the first person to throw it should be the one without any sin themselves teachable moment, right? That moment to where everybody's like, ah, I'm out. And everybody drops their rock and they drop their stone. In fact, there was one person who could have just continued to throw that stone, but you know, it was Jesus without, without sin. So the teachable moment uh, being perhaps, and this is in your notes, being perhaps we should take an inventory of our own indiscretions before pointing out those of others. How often do we get caught up doing that? We are so quick to point out the indiscretions of other people that we forget that, wait a second, their list is this long. You just don't like it. My list is this long. And what does that look like? Or Genesis chapter 2, a story that some of you are familiar with. Most of you might be familiar with this story. Adam in the Garden of Eden. And Adam is in the Garden of Eden, and, and God is talking to Adam. And keep in mind, in the Garden of Eden, he's in perfect harmony with God at this time. Everything is great. And God actually says, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat uh, from it, you will certainly die. Now, some of us might be going, why didn't God start with that part? Like, listen, Adam, don't eat, don't touch this, this will kill you. Everything else, though, is yours. He says, doesn't do that. He says, you can eat from anything but this one. And if you know the story, as it goes, Adam and Eve can't, uh, are, are tempted. They succumb to the temptation and sin enters the world. Teachable moment, though, from that. Turns out we, want, we tend to want that which we cannot have. There was one thing, one rule. Adam, you had one rule, and we broke it. God desires us to fully depend on and trust him. See, it wasn't about the fruit of the tree. It was... This is, this is the direction, fully lean on, fully trust, fully, fully depend upon me. Or finally, Matthew 18, God is leaving the 99 to go find the one sheep. This is another teachable moment that the Bible gives us. And they're scattered throughout there. It was hard, honestly, picking just three because the Bible is full of these teachable moments. And if you know the song, Reckless Love, it talks about this, song, this uh, scripture here. But God is leaving the 99 and it says, uh, what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? Now, here's the thing before I get to the teachable moment. I hear that and I'm like, amen. Praise God, because how often am I the one of the 99 that just kind of wanders off? In fact, there's an old hymn that says we are prone to wander. And if you kind of imagine what that looks like for God, his desire is to have us close all the time, but we are constantly doing this. 
and just wandering away. Or we come within his, his uh, guard there, within, within his uh, house where the sheep are gathered, and we, we kind of get, get into the uh, house where the sheep are gathered, and we look around and wonder what else is out there that we can maybe get our hands on. And then we might stray and we wander. And they're wondering, how come you're going to chase this one sheep? And he goes, well, you know, wait a second. If you lose one, don't you just leave the 99 and go to that one? Because the teachable moment here is you are valuable. This is the other teachable moment that I think that we get from that is God pursues a relationship with you. Pursues is an action word. God pursues a relationship with you. So these are all positive, and we should take time to understand these moments. I agree. We should take time to understand those. But for today, we're going to focus on one in particular, which is this. What can God teach us about making the most of our time? How do we make the most of our time? How many of you would say you're good time management priority people? Okay, two of you. That's good. (laughs) Three of you. Good. Peer pressure setting in. Anybody else? No? Some Some of us struggle with that. Uh, some of us struggle with how do we manage our time? How do we prioritize our time? Some of us might run into the, the uh, I don't have enough hours in the day to make all of these wonderful things happen. Here's the reality. We, our time might be full of wonderful things, but something's got to give at some point. So what does the Bible, what's the teachable moment that the Bible can provide us as far as these, these instances? What can we do? So the first thing that we need to consider as we're doing this, and by the way, inside of your, your uh, bulletin there, we have a couple of different things. We have the outline. So if you are wondering where those fill in the blanks are coming from, here they are. They're right here. All of them are right here. And then I also have this, because what I want to do today is to be able to provide this time management kind of a, kind of a tool for you, something tangible. And we'll talk through what that looks like. If I do need help managing time, what does that look like? How do I manage my time according to what scripture says? So the first, uh, the first thing that we need to do in order for us to be able to understand this concept of time is understand the definition because our definition differs from God's. Our definition of time differs from God's. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9 says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day, meaning uh, a thousand years is like one, a thousand years to us is like one day to God. So if we're worried about things not happening in the moment, consider that. Consider what that looks like. The Lord is not slow, though, to fulfill his promise. Because I think we, we view that his, his delaying, his delaying, uh, view, um, returning, right? And then fulfilling the promise of salvation and the resurrection and, and things like that. But it says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, though, as, counts, as uh, some count slowness, but is patient towards you. He's not being slow. He's being patient. Because he does not wish that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's kind of in a new light when you think about it. What's God taking so long for? Why, aren't, why isn't he returning? Why isn't he fulfilling the promise that he said he would? He's, he's not being lazy. He's purposely delaying is what that's saying because he wants his desire is for everyone to reach repentance. So God's taking his time, not because he's not eager, to fulfill, but, but really he does, his desire is to, for all of us to repent. Some of us in the room have made that decision to follow Christ, and we're, we're in. We're good. Some of us in the room, maybe we're still filling that out. Some of us in the room, maybe this is your first time you're hearing that. Let me tell you, there's not a sign-up sheet in the lobby for you to sign up for that. You can do that right now. You don't have to have an, an appointed time necessarily to sign up for that, that invitation from God. That's, that's something at any time, and we would love to talk to you about that. Whenever I hear that, though, that God is not delaying because he's not lazy, he's, he's just eager for you to join him. He's eager for you to come on. Words like grace and forgiving and loving come to my mind in that context when all of a sudden we shift the context of what that is. God's delaying because he loves you. God's delaying because he pursues you. Not because he doesn't. It's not like he missed his alarm and he's snoozing. It's delaying because he loves you. See, God's not bound by our perception of what time is. And this is a super hard concept. We live in a world of immediacy. And some of us, I don't know, I did this the other day. And maybe I'm ashamed of myself. But I waited in the McDonald's drive-thru for like three minutes. Got frustrated and left. Because it took too long. I don't have time for this. Three minutes? What are they doing? Cooking things? And sometimes we do that, and, and, and maybe it's for you. Check this out. Listen to this. As of 2013, our average attention span, eight seconds. 
The average attention span of adult, eight seconds. Now, this is uh, actually the, the, the downer part of this is in the year 2000, it was 12 seconds. It's getting shorter. It's dropped four seconds. The year 2000, eight seconds. Now, this means most of us, and, and I realize this, if the attention span of adult human is eight seconds, most of you are not even listening to me anymore. You checked out a long time ago. Let me invite you back. Please join me. Please join me up here. And I get it. I know people kind of go to the beach. We used to say it's totally fine if you mentally want to go to the beach. Just don't get a tan. Come back. Come back and join us. Eight seconds. So uh, more impressive though, and I don't know, you could take this for whatever it means. Average adult attention span is eight seconds. Average attention span of a goldfish, nine seconds. I don't even have anything else to add to that. You just take that for whatever it is. I just thought that was impressive, so I put that in there. So beginning, uh, and I don't know, I haven't talked to Matt, but I think this is probably what we should do. Beginning next Sunday, we should offer like 37 different services at approximately two and a half minutes each. You can pick which one you want to come to. And in, in and out. I don't know if he'll co-sign that or not. But I mean, our attention span, eight seconds. So you can imagine, foundationally, our judgment of time or what we're viewing as time is just different. In order for us to fully enjoy living in a way that is pleasing to the eyes of God, it's recognizing that God's time is different than ours, and that's okay. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us this, that there's a time for everything. And that might be where a lot of us stop and say, nope, there's not. I've tried. I've tried to do everything. It doesn't work. Scripture tells us there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Now, God's word says that there is a time, this is your fill in the blank, for everything, but not according to our timeline. See, I think, we, I think we get frustrated when it's not according to our timeline. It's not according to our timeline or our desires, but rather according to his appointed time. All of a sudden, when some of us reads words like that, I've dealt with personalities long enough that a lot of us don't like that lack of control that we have over the situation. Lack of control. It's not according to you. It's not according to your timeline. It's according to God's timeline. And we just talked about our timelines are very different. So, I'm in, and this is where, I don't know if you heard that, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity. And then you have that song stuck in your head. I'm probably dating myself, but you're welcome. You can, yeah, you can hang on to that for the rest of the service there. So if we have the foundation of what this looks like, so time is just different. Okay, I get it. We're being judged by two different time spectrums here, but where do I start? Matthew 6.33 gives us this awesome starting point. It gives us a glimpse of where to start. So I want to make the most use of my time. Where do I start? And Matthew 6.33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Probably a verse you're familiar with. Also one that maybe is equally frustrating if we don't understand what this looks like. Because I think the problem is that we skip to the second part of this verse all the time. I think we look at the second part and we see, and all these things will be added to you. It's like, yes, I know God. So I'll just start praying for all of these wonderful things to happen in my life. Added to you, added to me. Who's this, who is this God? And let me, let me start praying to this God and all of these things that I desire, that I want will be added to me. And I think we skip over this first part which is kind of the rule for the second part, which says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here's the other, other part of that. I have to seek first God. So if we're wondering where to start as far as time management is concerned, seek first God and his righteousness. Here's the truth of it. You are not righteous on your own. Your righteousness only comes from Christ. So if I seek first God and Christ's righteousness, all of a sudden, if that's your motivation, part number two, and all these things will be added unto you, all of these things that we desire, our desires will probably change. Our expectation of what we want and what we feel like we should have will probably change. Might not list all of those things, but I think this is a very clear uh, starting point there. This is why I think it's important as well, because if we go to verse 34, it's in your notes. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I think this is true. I thought about this. I think our frustration sometimes comes from the repeated behavior we have of expecting things to happen according to when it's convenient for us. So I think we get stuck in this cycle where I expect things to happen. I go to church, I pray, I tithe, I'm doing all of these things, and I still haven't gotten that 63 Corvette yet, just like I asked for. Still haven't got, for me, it's a boat. I haven't gotten a boat just like I've always wanted. 
And all of a sudden, when you start thinking about it through the lens of what does God desire you to have, maybe that's not in the plan. I heard a preacher one time say that he, he always wanted one of those uh, 63 Corvettes. And he said that he knows why God hasn't given it to him yet, because I'll kill myself if he gives me one of those. Like, I will kill myself. God knows better than to give me one of those, because I will kill myself in that. So understanding where to start first. So I want to deal with some of the main, uh, maybe potential misconceptions. God does not always desire us to be in the church. He does not always desire us to be in the church. God wants us in church, yes, but he also wants us out there with others and with our families. Sometimes I think we hear this. Sometimes I think we hear this it's like, okay, so God, God just doesn't want us to have any fun then. That's not true. God desires us to enjoy ourselves. God desires us to enjoy this life. Uh, Here's another one. God does not desire us to only experience solemn, worshipful moments. I love those solemn, worshipful moments. But I also know this, that God wants us to sing a joyful nose. And and even scripture encourages us to dance. Like we are just praising and worshiping. So if you're not dancing, you're doing it wrong, evidently. That's what I'm saying. God does not want us only spending time with each other. I think that's a misconception that God only wants us to be with like-minded people, with just with you know church-minded people. We are the church, and we are to be the goers and doers with unchurched people. And this is probably where a lot of you are going. Like, how come? Why are we doing this here right now? Because like I'm here in church right now. Why are you telling me that I'm supposed to be here? I'm literally here right now. But I don't have those not here here. So please go and tell like. Matthew 28, go and tell them, go and tell them. I think it's just a good reminder too. So then what? God does in fact a desire, uh, in fact desire a relationship with us. We should be seeking to spend time with each other outside of this building. I think that's true. Small group is an awesome, maybe that's a plug, I don't know, but that's an awesome opportunity to be able to do that as well. We should be seeking to nurture and lead our families. That's true. God desires us to do that. We should also go to our jobs and do do them as if we were doing them for the Lord. So your paper has a little grid there, and I want to talk through this real quickly, and it's going to be on the page or on the screen too. So uh, this is broken up, and you can look at it like this, but it's broken up into a grid. On the top left, you can read it better on your paper, but on the top left, it says important and urgent. That's that quadrant there. The top right is important, so it's still on the important line, but not urgent. Bottom left is not important, but urgent. And then the bottom right is not important, not urgent. So notice that I left some bullet points that are empty for you. So you can kind of think about this. Only you can, you know, only you know how your time is being spent and what you're prioritizing to put in your time. But I put some thoughts in there that we could start with. So for instance, important and urgent. I filled out the first one for you. I didn't want you to mess that one up. God, God, that's important, Right? So uh, if I'm putting God in the important and urgent, that means I am choosing to follow him. I am choosing to put this as my number one priority because all the other priorities that I have in my life are going to filter down from that. But I'm starting with God as that number one important and urgent. I need, to, I need to proactively, intentionally make time for God. That's what we're saying. I need God to influence my decisions, influence my path. I need God for all of these things. The other one I put there for you, church. It is important that we are making time for church. And this is probably the part where you're really going, yeah, I know, I'm here, I get it. <laughs> making time for church, proactively, intentionally making time for church. But let's, let's talk about this for just a moment because church is not necessarily just in this building. In fact, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to build his foundation, his church off of him. He's going to be the foundation of what this looks like. And he goes on to say that even the gates of hell won't be able to stop it. Church, if you are a Christ-believing follower, then you are the church. In fact, this building, I don't know if you know it before, but it was, it was a, a woodworking shop. It was like an antique mall at one time, and now it's a church. It wasn't always a church, but we are always the church. So whether we're leaving here, we put our church hat on, and then we take our church hat off when we leave, that's not the way that works. We are the church. So we are to be the salt and light from this building that goes throughout the community. The third one, small groups, important. And I say urgent as well. There's many values of a small group because I think, and let me just say this. 
I, pro- I, I mean, I know you know that I lead the small group ministry, so it won't be a surprise to you that I value small groups. But here's the, here's the reality. I think sometimes we look at small group and like, ah, oh, man, that's just one other thing I have to schedule. Ah, oh, man, I'm an introvert. Doesn't he know that? Like, I don't do people really at all. But here's the, here's the reality of the situation, though, too. Like, small group ministry is important because that becomes your family within a family. Small group ministry is important because that becomes your tribe within the church. Small group ministry is important because those are the people, like, when you are having life happen, that's the number one group that will know life is happening. If you come to church every week and expect Pastor Matt to understand and know everything that's going on in your life, probably not realistic. But small group ministry, if we're able to do that well... That is the group that surrounds you. That is the group that seeks you proactively. Small group ministry. That is your family. Uh, Important and urgent family time as well. Over here in the important, not urgent, I put volunteering. It's not urgent. I say that because it's not always an opportunity, but it is something that's important. I need to proactively schedule that. I need to proactively plan for that serve day. There's some, a bunch of lists around the corner right there. Now, no one has an excuse to immediately turn right when you leave that door because it's to the left. You all heard it right here. So turn left, go sign up for a surf day. There's one for the Humane Society out there. I know there's a lot of people. I get it. My wife wasn't going to let me sign up for that one because I would come home with all the puppies. <laughs> Did my part. Saved them all. But there's lots of other opportunities that you have to, to serve out there too. Serving within the church, group activities. We should go. We should go do, some, do fun stuff. Go, plan that time. I think that's important. Notice the top two quadrants, quadrant of necessity and then the quadrant of quality. That's life-giving stuff. And then bottom, not urgent, not, I'm sorry, urgent, but not important because we all have lives. We don't just live at church, but quote unquote, all work tasks. Some of those we view as like immediately some emails and voicemails. Some of those we view as I immediately have to take care of this. Notice what it's called is the quadrant of deception. Because I think I have to do it now. Turns out I don't. My cell phone goes off, bing, and we immediately look at it. We immediately look at 50 cent corn dogs. Awesome. Sonic, okay. (laughs) I needed to know that. Maybe not right now. But um, that was a waste of my time. That's a deception. I thought I immediately had to do that. And then some relationships. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then finally, the quadrant of waste down here on the bottom right. Some busy work, some time wasters, some escape activities. Some of us are escaping to the wrong place. Some of our escape activities are leading us down the wrong path. So the question is, what fills your boxes? How do you fill those in? Not that you need to answer right now, but I hope you're internally thinking about that. I left you a couple of blank bullet points so you could add two. I didn't see it, but I didn't see anybody scratching off. (laughs) Nope. Church? Nope. Small groups? Nope. So hopefully you'll add to what those look like. This is why it's important because sometimes putting God as a priority, Matthew 8, 18 through 22 says this, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law, a teacher of the law comes to him and says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Doesn't sound as appealing. Verse 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first, like I will follow you. Let me first though go bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now some of us might read that and be like, whoa, Jesus, like this is a, that's a big deal burying your father. What Jesus is saying is not to mourn the loss of your father. What Jesus is saying is there is one thing that should take priority in your life. And it is me, the life giver. In fact, Luke has the same account, and it goes on to say, Luke chapter 9, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Like, I'm totally in, but first let me go back and do this. And Jesus uh, replied to him, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for service in the kingdom. And sometimes, I don't know how many of you, you know, plows, especially driven by oxen, but the, the, the word picture there is this, like you're going along. This actually happened to me. My oldest son was driving one time. He was learning to drive. And I made the mistake of saying, I was in the pasture seat. I made the mistake of going, that's a pretty cow. That's what I said. That's a pretty cow. And next thing I know, we were like, and we were halfway into the ditch. And I was like, that was not for you to look at. You were supposed to look at that. I was simply saying, but note to my, note to self, right? If we put our hand on the pile and we're looking around, then all of a sudden our line is like this. And Jesus is saying, there's nothing that should make your line go like this. Like, keep your eye on me. Keep your focus on me. Let that be an influencer as you're putting together 
as you're putting together your time. So again, what, what fills your boxes? And I think this is reality, and I don't mean to step on your toes, but I might. And I might step on my toes too, right? And that's okay. But I think some of us would add a verse to this too. The Lord said, follow me. And I said, but yes, Lord, I will. Let me catch you in September though after lake season's over because it is nice outside. I don't even know if you're aware of that right now. Yes, Lord, I will follow you unless something more pressing comes up is what I will do. Yes, yes, Lord, I will. But I really want to focus on what other people are going to think about me if I choose to do that because it's not always a popular decision. Like I just want to think on what's this going to look like? Yes, Lord, I will follow you, but it depends on work. I'm just pretty tired sometimes. It's, and I, I wrote that, and I kind of laughed to myself as if we don't, don't think Jesus understands what tired looks like. Yeah, Jesus understands what tired looks like. Jesus is saying, I get all of that. I'm still your priority. Whatever it is or however you fill in the blank, try to do your best to not get in the wrong habits so we can fill in the blanks of that statement there. One other thing that I... I want to do here is give you kind of examples of why these things are important. So I just picked a few. Attending church, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Serving, serving the church. We put that in there as well. In Psalm 11, 2, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Fill in the blank. It says, we are reminded to do everything as if we are doing it for the Lord. Here's a fun fact. I did some research on everything. Everything actually means everything. All the things. Everything. Be proactive in staying away from toxic relationships. This was in your quadrant of deception there on the bottom left. Some relationships. It says, be proactive in staying away from these toxic relationships. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of, of uh, fools will suffer harm. That should be telling. Some of us are investing in relationships that are not giving anything back in return at that time, or they're not bringing life to us, or they're leading us down the wrong path. I love it. I love it. I hear stories, and I think we all have them. Like, I don't do the same things that I used to do. I don't hang out with the same people that I used to hang out with. Because I know what it's like to hang out with those people. Now you might be going, okay, so we're just supposed to minister to the people who are like us then. I get it. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand me. I think we can be a leader in all of those dis different situations. But sometimes we choose to put ourselves in a situation that is destructive and harmful. And we have accountability to own that process too. Here's a conclusion. Last fill in the blank. Don't forget about God during the summer. Like you all look lovely. You look great. The fact is during the summer, I think we, we kind of get away from this and our priorities kind of shift and we change how we fill out the quadrants there. We change how we choose to use our time. And I say this for a reason. I say this for a reason. Don't forget about God during the summer. I say this for a reason. And this is one of, man, I love this verse not because it's super inspirational because I think it's one of those that keeps me focused and grounded and I want to share it with you. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. And this is where it's like, man, many will say to me on that day, on the day you approach the kingdom of God and you say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, did we not drive out demons? And in your name, uh, did we not per perform miracles? And then he says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. I love that verse. And I don't even feel bad that we ended kind of on that note because here's the reality. Here's the reality. I think there's a lot of people that we are sacrificing the time that we should be spent creating a relationship with God. It is not about sitting in that seat. It's about creating a relationship with Christ that goes beyond these walls. I don't want any of you, any of us to get to that point and say, hey, I made it. And Jesus goes, I never even knew who you were. Because let me tell you, at that point, 
Talk about a teachable moment. That's a one-shot deal. That's a one-shot deal. This is your time now. And if you're going, well, how much time do I have? No idea. No idea. That's kind of the thing we're all trying to figure out, right? But I know where it starts. starts it starts right now. And like even, this is, this is, this is the reality too. Even right now, uh, we are closer to that time than when we were when I started this message. And now we're even closer than when I just started that last sentence. And now we're even closer than when I started that last sentence. You see what I'm saying? So we all have an expectation. We all have an accountability for us. And maybe this changed nothing for how you're going to prioritize your time. God wants the most use of your time. But number one on the list, God, God wants a relationship with us. This is your time. This is the time. God desires to pursue you. If you've not yet done that, man, I'd love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. You are going to make me cry. I would love to talk to you. I'm sure there's several other people that would love to wrap their arms around people who would just like to know more. I know our small group, this is another opportunity, but our small group was full of people like that. They just wanted to be able to wrap their arms around other people and tell them more. That's another benefit of small group. Let me pray for us and then we'll uh, move forward. Father God, it is in this time, God, that, that as I prayed before, God, that I just decrease and you increase. God, just these words that have been coming out, God, these are your words. They're not my words. God, these people in the, in the, in, in the seats right now just kind of hopefully self-evaluating. What does this look like? Maybe they're checking all the boxes, God, but maybe they're not. And I don't know. I just want to kind of rest in the maybe not. God, but there is no moment that is too late as long as we are still here. God, we have a conscious decision every day to be able to prioritize you. I just pray that you put that in the front of our minds as we prioritize. God, be with us. Walk with us. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, we praise you. And ultimately, I seek to glorify you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.